Good morning, and thank you for being here. Um, I'm assuming that if you're here, you probably have an interest in, in uh, a cadet PT program, uh, maybe specifically on some of the things that we've done uh, as far as implementing our program. Um, so today we're gonna kinda go through the nuts and bolts of our program, uh, more of a boots on the ground kind of approach, um, and talk about some of the lessons we've learned. Uh, we've, we've both been doing this for about six years, um, so it's been really a refinement process. Um, and I think we still got some valuable information that we pass along. <clears throat> so full disclosure, we are employed with the Colorado State Patrol, so we're here under their endorsement. Um, some of the objectives that we're gonna talk about and, and tackle today, um, we're gonna talk about uh, challenges with physically training a, a police recruit population, uh, identify needs for training programs based on task analysis. Um, Charlie's gonna get into that a little bit more later on and talk about Red Man and, and how uh, basically Red Man is the apex for our, our training program. Uh, and understand the, the need for a holistic appro approach to injury prevention. Um, <clears throat> with cadets, it's not all about um, physical performance, but also about uh, other things such as nutrition and, and sleep issues. Um, <clears throat> what this is not is uh, two doctors providing commentary on physiological factors. Um, we're not gonna be researching a, or talking about a, a bunch of statistics, although Charlie will hit on a few, uh, mostly injury statistics, and uh, this isn't a physical therapist guide to injury prevention. Um, basically, like he, just uh, like, we, like Matt uh, said, we're, we're two troopers uh, that work at the academy. Um, our full-time positions are um, dealing with two sides, uh, dealing with, with PTs and, and with, with the PT portion of, of our cadet program and dealing with uh, uniforms. So common challenges that, uh, that kind of come up when, when implementing a PT program. Um, the first one is gonna be uh, PT sessions per week. This is always a struggle. Um, we, we, we've had the, the honor of talking to quite a few people uh, this week and talking to them about their PT program. It always seems like it's a struggle getting more and more sessions. Um, we, hear, we hear quite a few people that don't get enough sessions. Uh, we're, right now, we're pretty blessed in that we get four sessions a week with, with our cadets. Uh, we get one hour a day, Tuesday through Friday. Um, sometimes this can be a challenge um, <clears throat> managing their schedules, but pretty much through the whole 22-week program, we get, we get uh, the four days a week with them. Uh, <clears throat> the, like I said, the length of the PT session can vary anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour, uh, depending on what they got going on for the day. And uh, uh, one of the, the, the uh, common issues that we have is just basically late class arrival or unscheduled departure. So we're always kind of battling that. Um, sometimes they got things going on throughout the day that might impede the, the PT program. So we might lose some time with them somewhere along the way. But for the most part, I, I gotta say that we usually get the, the four hours a week with them. <clears throat> this is always an issue, resource limitation. And uh, I, I kind of put up here an example of, of how much money we've actually put into PT program. Uh, since 2014, we've put about $900 into it. Um, we, we, we've had, luckily along the way, we've, we've bridged some partnerships and we've gotten a lot of equipment uh, that has, has either been donated uh, to us or given to us. Um, but for the most part, uh, it, it's always a struggle to get the money to buy the things that we need. Um, Whereas we have a really nice gym at our academy and over the last couple of years uh, getting the, the resources for that and the, and the, the monies to, to, to actually improve that gym has been pretty easy. Uh, as you can see, $35,000 they put into that gym. So <clears throat> we're always struggling with, with fiscal budgets and everything else in order to get the money to make it happen. But, um, but that seems to be really kind of a, a big challenge for us. Parallel programs with competing interests. Um, so one of the things that we're always battling is, uh, so there's the drill instructor side, it, it, as you guys know, with this, any kind of a state police or a highway patrol, um, we're paramilitary. Uh, and discipline and the DI program is very, very important. Um, <clears throat> so we're always combating, um, we're always combating that versus, versus our program, which is more of a hands-on kind of student coach aspect. Um, we really don't want them coming to PT stressed out. We want them to come there because it's a learning environment. Um, so uh, 
we, we, we just don't need them. We don't need the, the, quite the attention to detail and discipline that, that they normally have all day long. So having them switch that on and off, it, it can be a challenge. Um, the other one is defensive tactics. Um, <clears throat> whenever this program is going on, this is the two weeks that they aren't doing PT. So we do not do any kind of PT uh, while they're doing defensive tactics. Uh, uh, Charlie will go into that a little bit later on, but defensive tactics is very physically draining on them. Um, it, it's a workout of, the, of themselves, and for that two weeks, that's all they are doing is defensive tactics. And uh, like I said, Charlie will go into that a little bit more later on in a later slide. Physically underqualified candidates, I'm sure if you've any, dealt with a PT program, uh, you've run into this. We do not. Currently with the State Patrol, um, there is a physical entrance um, test that they have to take. It is not pass-fail. Um, basically, it's, it's just for our information only. It gives us an idea of where they are uh, fitness-wise, but it is not a disqualifier for hire. So when we get a, a class, we get a huge gamut of, of, of fitness levels. Um, so our biggest challenge is, is making sure that the top level of, the, of that group doesn't regress and that we're able to actually get the bottom level uh, of that group physically fit. And we've done a pretty good job of, of making that happen. Um, command perception or importance of, or lack of importance of physical training. So we, we run into issues where we have sometimes an overinvestment by command staff in, into the training of our, our cadets and vice versa, kind of like a, there's other times where we think that, or there's a, per a perception that it could care less. Um, <clears throat> we've had times where you know somebody will come back and they'll have a great idea, a command staff or one of our command staff members will have a great idea of what they want to implement. And uh, w without really taking into, into account that the two weeks that, that it's gonna take to implement that program is really gonna impede the process in, in, in the, the, the physical um, <clears throat> well-being of the, of, the, of the cadets. So how do we mitigate or rectify these challenges? Um, first of all, communication. <clears throat> we do a pretty good job of any chance that we can that we, we, that we get in front of command staff, we take that time to talk to them and educate them on what we're doing. Um, we throw a lot of st stats at them. Um, we collect a lot of data and our partnerships with a lot of people um, that we have met here through TSAC. Um, we work a lot with uh, Dr. Jay Dawes and Rob Orr. Um, they look at a lot of our data and we're able to actually throw that at command staff. Uh, money talks, so definitely when we can tell them how much uh, money we're, we're, we're saving in in injury prevention, that really goes a long way. Um, and we take the time to educate them. So whenever we get them for in-service, so we have command staff in-service, we take the time, that opportunity to talk to them. If we can catch our chief in the hallway and talk to them a little bit of our program, we do. Because they're just never gonna actively seek you out and talk to you about your program. You have to be pretty aggressive about it. <clears throat> Guys, to give you some context, um, <clears throat> This presentation is all about what we do and, and where we are. We thought it might be helpful to tell you where we've been um, and why we are where we are and why we do what it is we do. So um, to give you a little bit of agency context, our agency in total uh, is about 1,500 members. It's comprised of about 800 uniforms. And at any given time, uh, we run a, usually a single cadet class, uh, one in the spring, one in the fall, just like semesters. And at any given time, we usually have somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 cadets. Uh, this upcoming class, we are um, bringing 43 in. So to give you an idea of the population that we're talking about. Um, as Ryan already mentioned, we currently don't have an entrance standard. And most of this presentation doesn't have to do with before their cadets or after their cadets. It really has to do with while they're cadets. So if you have questions about those things, we can talk about them at the end, but we'll try and address really while they're cadets, what, what they are doing. So some history for what we did. So before 2010, um, up to that year, PT every morning was at 0, 0500, three days a week. One of the challenges with that was uh, for anybody that does any type of resistance training or is aware of any resistance training concepts to do Resistance training that early on an empty stomach, um, it's hard to get some maximum performance levels out of people. <clears throat> so in 
So the programming was, was difficult to relate to the job just because to get high levels of performance was, was hard for people. Um, around 2010, PT moved to the afternoons. We, we did it at uh, 4 p.m. is when it was scheduled for. That falls back on what, what Ryan already mentioned with some of the time constraints and needs for earlier, uh, early departure and late arrival to PT sessions. When you're dealing with um, a later in the day session, we got a lot of people's other leftovers. People get there late to class, they get there tired from all day of class. <clears throat> 2014, um, we kind of struck, struck a, a gold mine, we felt like, in a compromise, and PT was moved um, at, at our behest to 615. So cadets eat at 515 now. They PT at 615, so they've got about an hour to digest. They eat very, very quickly. If you are unaware of a cadet eating environment, it happens pretty quickly. So they've got about an hour of downtime. And they, they come in with not full stomachs, but they come in with some nutrition um, factors uh, going in. So the need for a task or needs analysis. Prior to 2012, um, we PT because people need to be in good shape. And we didn't PT really with a very specific direction in mind. We did um, entrance assessments. So when cadets came in, they, they entered and were assessed. We used a, a combine style assessment, a third party vendor that, that did a fantastic assessment um, with this, this very broad scheme of tests and that gave us a massive amount of information that we really didn't do anything with. We knew that within these tests, these candidates performed in these ways, and then we went and did a PT program completely unrelated to any of the tests or any of the potential needs that existed. So as we started to, to develop um, this idea of what, why are we PT in the first place, we began to identify the real needs to do the, the needs analysis. So in 2012, we really identified that Redman um, in the defensive tactics program is the, the physical apex of the academy process. Um, for anyone that isn't familiar with Redman, uh, it's an extremely physically demanding process. Ours lasts in the neighborhood of a total of about six minutes. Um, it's a, a multifaceted event. Um, to give you a heart rate scheme, um, on average, in, when we've taken heart rates during this, we see heart rates around 95% up to about 105% of estimated maxes. So this is an extremely demanding event. Having um, Jay Dawes there to, to, to do some blood lactate testing, um, we see blood lactates of over 20 uh, from time to time. So it's a pretty demanding event. So identifying that as the first need in the academy process was key to the program. In 2015, there was a second component of needs identified. So <clears throat> to do the job of a trooper, there are minimum qualifications. There was always a minimum physical standard. And we knew this going in, but really all this created was a two trajectory scheme for, for a, a needs analysis. Early on in the academy or, or midway around week uh, 16 out of the 22 pro week program, there is the red man experience in defensive tactics. So we have an accelerated need to, to get people to the point where they're physically capable of surviving and, and being durable throughout that event. On the longer trajectory, just the exit standards of, of the minimum standards of being a trooper was our second need. So what we see is we do, we do three assessments during the academy, an entrance assessment, a midterm assessment, and an exit. And what we usually see is the highest, the highest level of performance at the midterm assessment. And really we can draw back on probably this, this need to some degree as a, as a reason for this. We are accelerating them all the way up to the point of red man and defensive tactics training. And then the focus shifts to some degree to, to much more task-oriented and job-oriented um, learning throughout the rest of the academy. And we actually see, to some degree, a small diminishment in their performance from that midterm to the exit assessment. However, they're still far above, um, generally speaking, the minimum standards. We'll get into some of the stats of, of what that looks like here in a minute. <clears throat> this defensive tactics need, once it was identified, was a major, major driver for the PT program. Um, for, for those of you familiar with the physical demands of a Krav Maga-based program, this is a very physically demanding program. And our cadets do this in a solid two-week block. So for, for ten, 10 days out of a two-week period, they are doing Krav Maga training. During this time, and we'll get to this in the blocks, but during this time, they don't PT because this is in and of itself a, a very physically demanding event. And taking that holistic approach, understanding that this is physical training, 
we, we try not to double dip there. But that, that defensive tactics need really was part of the, the needs analysis. This CSP 705, this is a form that is utilized to, that identifies the minimum tasks of a, of a trooper. And for most agencies, there will be a job description. And, and this, this form will exist that identifies minimum tasks. This can be a very good driver for the long-term uh, needs analysis of, of an academy PT program. So uh, the very first thing on this form is, is very heavy lifting. It speaks to having to lift um, over 100 pounds infrequently, however, still a minimum necessity. So when you, we used this form, it really started clearing up what we need to have them doing. So then again, in 2015, when those, those minimum critical job tasks were identified, uh, again, with the help uh, of Dr. Dawes and UCCS, we did a critical job task testing. So we brought in 305 troopers. We were able to identify some manifest relationships between what it is they had to do and, and what assessments gave us a, a clear picture of their ability to do those tasks. So using that, we had the four, uh, four battery test that we used for um, assessments, being the uh, vertical jump that speaks to power production, the one minute sit ups and one minute max push ups that both speak to muscular strength and endurance, and the beep test that speaks to aerobic capacity. And that aerobic capacity, um, it's, it's an amazing how important that component really is to the underlying success and durability of a cadet. So on that, the first day that they show up, uh, just getting to the nuts and, and bolts of what it is we're doing, on the first day sh they show up, a pretty comprehensive assessment is performed. And in that, they do that, for, that four battery physical test, but there's also an interview process <clears throat> because even with privacy respected and, um, and HIPAA laws in place, there's some things we have to be aware of. If there are medications that will affect someone's physical performance or their ability to do the job, we ask those questions. Um, we get a good picture of food allergies. We get a good picture of their physical abilities through the assessment and a, a very comprehensive interview is done so that we know who it is that we're dealing with. When risks are identified, there's usually a long, um, a long, counseling session with, with an individual cadet <clears throat> for the simple reason of we'd be remiss not to tell them that, that there may be some problems moving forward, that we are aware and we will train them to the best of their, our abilities, uh, but, but we need some, some acknowledgement on their part that we may have a longer way to go. So this communication has actually been worth its weight in gold, just to have a very honest one-on-one -on -one discussion with somebody that we may have identified more at risk has, has been really, uh, really well received. When we talk about at risk, this was a model developed, um, this is a model developed by, by, by Dr. Dawes, and what we have here is a, a categorization of risk profiles for cadets. So for the person, um, for the person that is not, competing, or not completing a level five, seven on the beep test, or doing 32 push-ups in one minute, it speaks to their um, lack of durability within the academy. So we know that that person stands an 83% more chance, higher chance of being injured and not successfully completing the academy than the person that is doing one or the other of those two things. So having that information was, was really, really big. So when I speak about um, talking in a one-on-one -on -one fashion to somebody that's identified at risk, that's not on a subjective, we believe you may be at risk, that's on an objective level. One of the major developments in our academy process has been the implementation of something called Zero Week. So after this model was developed and we started identifying that these people entering that, that were at a higher level of risk um, existed and we, we can't cause them to not come into the academy, we have to deal with it, something called Zero Week was implemented. And this has been a huge shift because in most um, state police academies or, or um, any paramilitary-based academies, <coughs> There's, there's the stress inoculation period and the, the stress period um, that usually comes right up front. It's something called hell week or hell day, but right in the very beginning, people are, are hit with this full, full facet of DI involvement and drill programs, and it's, it's a stressful event. What we did is we moved that to the beginning of week two, and the entire first week is simply orientation. And they still get that full dose. There's, there's no cultural issue that they didn't do what we had to do, that, that whole thing that may exist. They still get that full dose, it's simply moved back. So during that first week, there's a major educational period in not only this is what's coming, but there's a major uh, emotional component. This is how best you can deal with it. And here are some physical clinics on how to safely and efficiently perform the movements you're going to be required to do 
things as simple as running. How can we make this person run a little more efficiently? So during this first zero week, we do four, um, we do four movement clinics. Those movement clinics, we do a, power, uh, a hip hinge clinic where we spend a, a pretty decent amount of time simply learning how to hinge at the hips and perform a deadlift and a squat. This foundational movement pattern that people have to do if, they're, if a DI tells them to go do burpees, well, they, they know how to hinge at the hip and they can do burpees more safely. We spend time doing a power clean clinic so that we can work on acceleration and explosiveness and that comes into play later in the PT program. We do a pull up clinic on how to become more efficient pulling themselves up and there's, this is easy to relate to the job tasks. Um, that pull up clinic, having, telling a cop that at some point they may have to have the ability to pull themselves up over something it is not very hard to wrap your mind around and it's very easy to help start causing some job relatedness to the uh, cadets or some understanding. And the running clinic is, is major. Ryan has done a running clinic with them for, for years and that has been an impressive thing to watch. When you take someone that just has always run and they give them some things to think about and watch the, the effect in their gait and their efficiency in running, it's really started to limit some of the injuries we've seen. So if we go through the PT program by the weeks, the first, the first two weeks, we just call general conditioning. We spend time working on a dynamic warm-up, which we'll get into the dynamic warm-up in, in detail. But we spend these first two weeks working only on a dynamic warm-up and general conditioning. They spend time um, doing calisthenics and, and running and working with their own body weight and free space and learning this dynamic warm-up. The dynamic warm-up really focuses on mobility, agility, um, dynamic stretching, in, in two different modalities. Um, on the left side of your screen, these are all the, the mobility movements that, that we do with, and I'll give you some examples. And on the right side of the screen are the, the isotonic movements we do under band resistance. So this warm up takes in, in total somewhere about 10 minutes. In the early days, it takes a lot longer as, as they're learning. But what we found with this, with this warm up, and I really have to credit, um, Physical therapist from Asheville, North Carolina, CSCS, Brian Lawler, if any of you know him, he brought this to us around that 2011 time frame. If we back up to, to why we, uh, we brought him in, 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 well, I guess in 2012. In 2012, we had some major instances of rhabdo. And as I've been here this week, I've had three, three people talk to us about rhabdo, so it seems appropriate to bring it up. But because, because of that, we brought Brian Lawler in and he was able to, to identify some needs. And as, through our partnership, we, we developed this warm-up that was sustainable and repeatable on a, on a daily basis. There's no overuse concerns uh, with this warm-up, but what we did find is people's mobility um, and their preparedness for PT really, really went through the roof. So when we're talking about, um, I just call these things what they are. When we talk about an ankle grab, we're just talking about an ankle grab. The cadets do this in a walking fashion across the floor. They can do it in an organized fashion um, so that it's something they can learn the routine and then, then do on their own w with us there but without any, any necessary intervention. So they would simply walk across the floor doing an ankle grab, they walk back across doing a knee grab and, and do those things in that order that way and it's, this has worked really, really well. Now in that zero, zero week when we talk about these things and these movements, we spend a lot of time talking about what they should be stretching, what they should be concentrating on and the keys to the, the forms of, of these movements. So it's not just a knee grab. There's a lot of time spent in that educational session as well. We talk about the isotonics uh, with, the, with a band, um, or here an isometric, that plank, th these things are done for time. So on the dynamic um, warm-up and the agility portion of this, they, they do this in distance, and it, with, then when they do the banded movements, they do it in time. So we have a clock running so that we, they can keep track of their time and, and what's, what's going on there too. And then a thruster, um, we, we call it a thruster, but it's really just nothing other than a front squat with a push press. Um, but but there's a, it's a last component to the warm up. So as we move later on in the weeks, weeks four, five, and strict six, we move into strength and hypertrophy training uh, with the simple acknowledgement that really a bigger motor unit means a stronger motor unit. And during this time, um, we spend a lot of time with familiarization of movement patterns. So as they're progressing, we start with, with very, very light loads. And doing the same movement a couple of times within the same week, they progress through these pretty, pretty quickly. I'll give you an example here. What, uh, this is the, a log that we keep. When Ryan talked earlier about, about documentation, cadets keep a PT log. 
So we're able to look every single day at what it is they did. Um, we keep their uh, RPE, we keep their rate of fatigue, <coughs> and, and how they perceive that workout. So if you look at the very far left side, this, this workout was three deadlifts um, and nine push-ups. They would do this in a partner fashion. And what this partner fashion has done is, is been really helpful for the coaching aspect and, and their own self-awareness. So to give you, for instance, how that workout would happen, one of Cadet A would do three deadlifts, then they would do nine push-ups. And they'd do that under the watchful eye of their, their partner cadet with them, uh, with both of us overseeing the entire event. But if their partner cadet picks out some problems, they talk about it. Then they switch, and cadet B does their nine deadlifts and, or their three deadlifts and their nine push-ups. And they just do that for the period of time, and we allow them to progress in weight, always reserving the right to, to put a limit on their weight or take the weight off and, and readdress form. <clears throat> Moving through the week, um, the first two sessions are always uh, load-oriented strength and hypertrophy sessions. The third session during this block is always a deload day. So we spend that third session um, not under load, working on agility-based uh, movements. And then at the end of the week, we move back to almost, almost a um, hybrid workout of the first two in the week to, to re, um, reorient those same motor units. As we move into week seven and eight, it's, uh, it looks somewhat similar to the strength and hypertrophy block of their training. However, we add um, a, a higher level of cardiovascular training into those deload days and incorporate it into some of the, the movements. <clears throat> Nine and 10, we start focusing on intensity. Um, I'll tell you, have, having looked back over my first involvement with the PT program, there was a very early um, emphasis on intensity and is always go, 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 with not as much emphasis given to safety and, and, and movement efficiency. And having blocked it in this fashion, we're able to now ramp up intensity um, and do so a little more safely. So when, when we talk about intensity, um, move, moving back, a lot of this, the metric that we work within is time. So we don't dictate loads or what it is they should be doing but what we do dictate is we're going to do it for approximately this amount of time and let them orient their own loads within that amount of time. And what that, that, what that allows for is, like Ryan said, that very top group that comes in, they're still lifting at the top of their abilities. That bottom group that comes in, they're still lifting within their abilities. The, the great equalizer is time. As we move into this intensity, uh, the, the higher intensity model, what we're really now starting to, to look at is restricting that time component. And now we know what their abilities are, so they will do X in, in such amount of time and, and start raising the intensity. So this, this PT log looks a lot different than, than what we looked at before. Um, the rep schemes will be different. Um, on the far right, we, we have a wall ball broad jump and front squat workout that is a very, very intense workout. Um, looking at the RPEs, there's a lot of seven and eights. So this is a very different thing than what we saw in the strength and hypertrophy block. As we move into week 13 and 14, this is where they're doing defensive tactics and wholly defensive tactics. I'll tell you this was not always this way. Defensive tactics was spread out through the training. However, once we identified that defensive tactics and Krav Maga training is physical training, and we probably should recognize it as such, this became its own thing. So everything we did up to that point really is leading to these two weeks, as we already discussed, because these, this is the, the apex uh, of the academy, and this is, if you are going to see um, a concentration or cluster of injuries, this is really where it's at. I'll tell you, having utilized this model, those injuries have been diminished, which we'll get into in a little bit. As we get out of, um, as we get out of Krav Maga and defensive tactics training, we move into a, a somewhat would look a lot more randomized model, uh, an undulating model that is intensity based, but is varied across the modalities and, and not as much uh, repeat in movement patterns across any given week. 18 and 19 things start to get interesting for us because we spend a lot of time educating the cadets. We'll spend a lot of time on a whiteboard before their PT program showing them how we program and why we program what we program. And we will start allowing them to program their own workout within some, within some confines and explaining 
okay, well, you, you, you really like um, wall balls, but let's explain why that may not work in this workout. So we spend a lot of time in education in these blocks. And then moving to the final two weeks um, of the training, this is self-directed. So the two weeks prior, they've been learning how to program. These last two weeks, we're hands off. We're always there and available and, and we walk around and help people and still address form or anything like that. However, it's self-directed and I'll tell you why. This has been, um, this has been a, a, a topic of conversation for a while but it's because when they leave the academy, we still want them doing PT. And we can, we can look at it as it's just the academy event, or we can recognize that we're really trying to set them up for their career. So when we have had our thumb on people for an entire academy, and they do exactly what we tell them to do, they never develop their own, their own patterns uh, of, of appreciation for physical training. And I'll tell you that has changed with instituting this, and I, I was kind of resistant to this myself. Um, because I, I like having my thumb on them, and, and you'll do this. It, it's the sadistic part, whatever. But this has been, this has been a, an overwhelming success. And I'll tell you, in their post-graduation critiques, this has been a big deal. And it's enjoyable to watch them start to enjoy what they program for PT. Now, this isn't to say they can come in and do whatever it is they want. They're, they're still within the construct of something productive and something that really addresses those, those two-fold needs that we talked about earlier. So if we see, um, to, to, to use Rob's quote for the week, if we see somebody just focusing on bicep curls within the squat rack for, for uh, a week, well, then that's, that's not gonna fly. But it's certainly taken under consideration. So we've had, some, we've had three major areas of, of positive results from, from this programming model. They've been in their performance, the cadet's performance. It's been in injury mitigation and in body composition. And uh, in that body composition, I'm gonna address a specific class that, that we have a little bit of numbers for. <clears throat> These graphs are pulled from a, a Rob or J. Dawes study um, that, that is, I think, coming out soon if it's not out already. But what this graph is speaking to is the progress we see um, during the academy. Now this, this is um, used from an, an older class where we were still um, narrowing down the, the assessment that we would ultimately use. But what we saw here from beginning to end is about a nine to 12% increase across the board from the time they enter to the time they exit. So in the four test battery, we see about a nine to 12% increase at the point of exit. At the point of midterm, um, what we see, this is males, here's females. Um, I'm sorry, yes, females. What we see <clears throat> really is um, at the midterm, almost about a 14% increase, and then on average about a 2% diminishment uh, from that midterm assessment to exit. I say we can, we can speculate as to why most likely there's, it's just the concentration, the change in concentration of training. When we look at injuries, um, guys, I'm gonna tell you, we track all injuries. And to first give you a very brief description of what an injury is, if a cadet complains about something, um, nine times out of 10, we, that will be classified as an injury. That, that's just the way it is. Once, uh, once it goes into to any form of writing, once they've notified someone, there's no, there's no more nine out of 10, it's a 10 out of 10, that's an injury. So this may be something that's never addressed at all, and it could be something that was, is catastrophic. I will give you the context of, of what we're talking about for the PT-related injuries. In 2017, I'm gonna skip through some of these. Um, <clears throat> let's just go to the, the overview. So we, have them for t we had three classes in 2017, and the last one, 2017-3, was a lateral class. That'll become important in a minute. So what we did is we took in lateral transfers. They were already certified as peace officers in the state of Colorado. We did an abbreviated academy with them and put them out to the field in about half the amount of time. They did 11-week academy versus a 22-week academy. So we ran that concurrently with the 2017-2 class. But what we saw, um, so if we summarize the 2017 injuries, Across 2017 as a whole, in all academy training, there were 22 injuries. Three of those 22 were staff members. 19 of the 22 were cadets. <clears throat> 14 of the 19 resulted in lost time. Let me give you the definition of lost time for us. If a cadet comes back with a restriction that says they can't do lunges for five days, that is lost time, okay? So 
we're, we may be talking about something very, very serious. We may be talking about something that ultimately in three days is nothing at all. But 14 of the 19 resulted in lost time. Two of our cadets that were injured were recycled into other classes uh, because of what, whatever injury they experienced. <clears throat> of those two, one did not graduate ultimately. They were recycled three times, and um, this career path was not for that person. Of all those 22 injuries and 19 of them being cadets, six of them were related to PT, physical training. Of those six, five were directly related to running. I found this to be a very interesting find as when we go back through the logs, we spend, we spend some time running, uh, but these are not overuse running injuries. And of those six, two were stepping in a pothole and, and twisting an ankle. So <clears throat> it's, it was pretty interesting to look at, even though we don't spend a, a massive amount of time running, um, they're familiarized with running, they do run, they know how to run, they're able to run, and running is still the number one cause for injury in PT. So something to be aware of. I'm sure that's not groundbreaking to anybody in this room, but it's, it's interesting once you see it on paper. So when we talked about body composition, this is directly related to that lateral class. So in the 11-week period of time, nine, um, of 18 cadets were identified as overweight. Those 18 lost a cumulative 159 pounds in nine weeks of PT. They had an 11-week program in total. They don't PT the first week or the last week. In the nine weeks, they, uh, they lost about nine pounds per cadet. So about a pound a week average is what, what we were looking at in, in a body composition change, which we felt like was a success in that amount of time. So we've used the term holistic approach to PT a few times. A big part of this is understanding that this PT is a very small part of this cadet's day. And I think we can forget that very easily because PT is what we care about. That's what we're there to do. How can they not care as much as we do? But these, these are people, as, as much as it's hard to admit at this point in their training, uh, they're still people. These guys are doing class from 12 to 16 hours a day. You know, this is, this is not a small task for them. <clears throat> Within those 12 to 16 hours, many of their courses are very physical in nature. To stand on a firing range for 12 hours out of a day and put 800 rounds down range, this is, this is a tiring event. And it's easy for us to lose sight of that, but it's something we have to recognize uh, if we want to move forward successfully and, and uh, look for signs of fatigue and injury and uh, address those things as, as necessary. So the lessons learned, we'll let um, Ryan finish it up. We'll address any questions you have at the end. We're getting close. Um, there's some of the nuts and bolts of what it is we do and why. <clears throat> Here you go, buddy. Thanks. So some of the lessons learned, um, first of all, document everything. Um, anything that comes down the pipe, we note it. Um, we relay that information uh, up, our, up a chain of command. Uh, so we have a lead uh, drill instructor. Um, if we have somebody that we're worried about, we'll pass the information along to them. Uh, we'll write memos. Uh, we'll send emails. And, and then we'll check on that individual throughout the day. Um, <clears throat> Instructor critiques are very important. Um, we listen to them at the end of uh, at the end of their class. They have a, a chance to critique us, um, and, and we take that as, as an opportunity to learn from them. Um, this last class, <clears throat> we actually sat down and talked with them um, and asked them if there was anything that we could do better. And one of the things they brought up was nutrition, and that's really a struggle for us at the academy because we don't have a whole lot of control over um, uh, the cafeteria and the food that kind of that comes out of there, to a certain extent we do, and we can make suggestions, and they work with us as best they can. But at our academy, they're providing food not only for um, the cadets and the academy staff and everybody else that works at the academy. We have a number of specialties that are based out of the academy, but also for uh, CDOT. Um, and they, they provide a lot of uh, money for food and have quite a bit of say in what comes out of there. Um, so with that being said, um, cadets still do not uh, they do not get caffeine for quite a while through the, uh, the academy. They're not allowed to drink soda, um, no sugar, um, anything like that. We do the best uh, to give them, you know, some sort of protein source with every meal. Uh, we try to stay away from fried foods. We try to do all the right things. Um, sometimes it's unavoidable, um, but but uh, we do the best we can. But one of their uh, one of their complaints was um, it was eating in the morning. Some of them like to eat before uh, before PT, and some of them did not. 
So we worked with uh, food services and uh, we kind of came up with a plan. So now every morning they have a, a refrigerator that's stocked with, um, you know, like hard boiled eggs, vegetables, um, some fruit. Um, uh, we actually have some uh, really clean uh, protein bars that they can eat if that's what they would rather have or, or they can eat breakfast. Um, so it's, it's up to them or, um, or, or not eat at all. Uh, it's their choice. So we leave that up to them. <clears throat> and then uh, progress reports. So you saw the PT logs. We look at those every day. Um, we, we really try to um, focus on, on uh, fatigue. So if, if there's been times where we, we get ready to start a PT session, they'll come in and um, they'll be dragging. And we can tell. Uh, so we'll pull the PT guide who is who's leading the, the PT and you know, we'll ask them, hey, what did you guys do last night? You know, and they're like, well, last night we were, we were out till 11 doing night driving. I'm like, okay, well, maybe, maybe we're going to need to change some things. Maybe we're going to have to do a deload day today. Um, so we look at those. Uh, we, we pass on these reports. We have a staff meeting every week. Uh, we get together, and, and it just focuses primarily on cadets. And we give our progress report on cadets, you know, who to, who to be watching out for, so-and-so is struggling, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and we go off of that. So we stay, try to do the best we can to stay really in tune with the class and, and, and keep that open line of communication. <clears throat> so every change has a downstream effect. So <clears throat> like Charlie was saying, uh, we're paramilitary. And sometimes it's really hard to go away from that. Um, we used to incorporate paramilitary into our PT program, uh, which Charlie and I were never a fan of. Um, it, was, it was just really hard. Um, but, you know, they wanted to keep up that intensity, especially through week one, um, hell week, if you want to look at it that way. So it just basically transitioned into PT. Um, they decided to take that out. Um, and, and for the most part, it's been, it's been a good change. Um, it, it makes it a lot easier on us. Um, we're able to actually focus on coaching them. They aren't so stressed out. Um, it, it's a good learning environment. Um, but what we see is really um, the lack of discipline. So kind of the, some of the kind of being a little bit disrespectful. Um, they take a long time to set up. We're usually but when, when we incorporated um, P, uh, or the drill instructor program in the PT, um, they, they set it up really fast. Um, so it was a lot more efficient. So we're kind of seeing some of the downstream effects, but for the most part, it's been pretty positive, you know, removing that part from our PT program. Um, you know, now it's, it's more of a more friendly atmosphere. Um, they're slapping each other on the back. They're allowed to talk. Um, we play some music. Um, they, they, they have a good time, and they get a lot out of it. And in the end, we're getting what we want out of it. They're, they're graduating from the academy, mostly you know, injury free, and they're, they're extremely fit when they leave. Uh, time of day for a PT session. Um, <clears throat> Charlie kind of alluded to this. We, we tried a couple different things. Um, you know, when we had a lateral class, it was really a challenge because um, I, I, the lateral class didn't start until two months into the cadet class. Um, so obviously we couldn't PT them together. So we were PTing at the beginning of the day, and then we were PTing the laterals at the end of the day, which made a very long day for us. Um, but it was the only way to kind of make that work. <clears throat> uh, the cadet schedule and availability may impact PT sessions. So we run into a lot of problems, like right now, when we're both here, um, we have to have somebody cover for us. And really, there isn't anybody else that, that can really do it. Um, so other things get scheduled, um, and, and they lose a week. So we have to kind of work a way around with that. They do, they do a lot of ride-alongs, and sometimes they do them really early in the morning. That impacts our ability to train them. And the number of uh, cadets uh, influences uh, PT sessions. So we're really, at, our capacity is, is about 40 cadets, about what we can handle safely. Um, so our next class is going to be well over 40 cadets, so we're looking at PT and cadets, um, basically one, one class. Uh, first thing in the morning, and then the next hour will be the second class. And that's the only way we can safely do it. Uh, really, because in the end, every morning it's just Charlie and I, and it's just too many people for us to keep eyes on. I talked about the snack program implementation. implementation. That's actually been a really big hit um, and has worked really well for us. 
we, we do the, be the best we can to monitor that. Um, you know, they have a t tendency to um, overindulge and eat a little too much. So there's certain points in the day when we will actually take that program away from them. Um, the one thing I want to mention, and, and we didn't really hit on this, is that we, we do not use PT as a, as a form of discipline. Um, we, we really, really don't care who, who's screwing up and who's doing what. Um, that information is relayed to us, but we do not use that to punish the class. Their, their workouts stay the same no matter what. Um, <clears throat> so I, I just wanted to stress that. Um, and then com um, competing interests, we, we kind of talked about that. Um, a lot of the skills programs um, can sometimes get in the way. Defensive tactics, we obviously lose uh, those two weeks, so we, we, we see a little decline in their fitness levels um, because of that. Uh, but but I'm, I'm going to tell you overall, um, and Charlie didn't really hit on a lot of numbers, when, when people are exiting the academy, they're, they're exiting and they're, they're running the beep test at about three to four levels higher than when they started. So they, they make pretty, pretty extensive progress through, throughout our PT program. <clears throat> Definitely, um, if I was really going to give you some advice, um, when, when you come here and, and you come to TSAC, Definitely don't be a wallflower. Get out and talk to people. Um, our, our first year here, we, we, we kind of came here. We just kind of took it all in. Um, this is our sixth year here. Um, and since then, our network uh, of, of those that are willing to help out and, and we, we can reach out to for help has grown. And um, we, we couldn't do, a, do any of it without them, for sure. Um, so full transparency, you know, I just want to make sure that, that we're giving you all the information you really need. Uh, documentation is super important. Uh, we, we document everything. We spend a lot of time writing memos, um, doing progress reports, reviewing logbooks, those kind of things. Um, communication with command is super important. Um, every opportunity you have to talk to your command staff and educate them about your program and, and saying, hey, you know, my program exists. It's out here, and this is why it's important. You know, uh, we, we truly believe that fitter officers make better decisions in critical situations. We have the data to support that. We'd like you to take a second and look at what we have. Um, we, we don't ever, I don't think we ever miss an opportunity to talk to some member of command staff and really kind of pump up the program. Um, supporting data is huge. Um, we, we, we collect data like it's going out of style. And fortunately, we have got guys like Jay Dawes and Bob Lockie and everything else that we can just forward that stuff on and they can do their magic with and send it back to us and then we can go to our command staff and say, hey, look look at this. This is what we got. And, and persistence. Um, th there's times where we need stuff, um, we need it now, and we'll just keep forwarding the same, same memo up the chain until we get until we get a, an answer. And sometimes it just means we gotta go hand deliver that memo, then that's what we do. Or if we gotta go knock on a major's door to get what we want, then, then that's what we do. Really quick, some acknowledgements. I've already met, mentioned some of these people. Jay Dawes is a really good friend to our, um, to our program. Couldn't do any of it without him. Uh, Dr. Rob Orr and Dr. Robert Lockie, and, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other people I'm missing, but these, these people have been instrumental in, in not only helping us publish some of the research that we've done, but just being there to give us advice. And, you know, I mean, whenever, whenever we're kind of mulling something over in our office, I'm like, you know, I don't know if we should be doing this. I know if we pick up the phone and call one of these guys, it, it, they'll, they'll step up to the plate and, and, and help us out. So. All right, questions? Yes. Yes. So, um, first off, I, th I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge um, that a trend is some, sometimes hard to identify when injuries are, are less than 10 in a year uh, in a program. However, with that said, you're exactly right. So the implementation of the zero week was probably the single biggest thing we did to, identi to identify um, some injury mitigation needs. However, um, we just had a, we had a, a three session meeting with our risk management office, wherein we, um, we got potholes filled. 
We uh, asked for signs to be put up around the gym in inclement weather so that people aren't tracking in. Uh, the, the gym has full open access, right? So people can come in as, as they're going to other classrooms in the academy. So we've asked for signs so that people go around the gym during a PT session just so we're not getting the floor wet. Because a lot of these injuries are anomalies um, in that somebody slipped. It's not because it was an overuse injury or a repeated um, pattern injury. Um, so risk management is helpful in that. But if I really fall back on the big, biggest single thing we did, it would be the zero week. Just the, the foundational movements and the, um, the use of repetition early on in a stress-free environment to teach healthy movement patterns, not under load, has been the single biggest thing. Sure. Please. Uh-huh. Yeah, so it's via Google Sheets. It's via Google Sheets. Yes, so that, so that day, they fill out each one. So when they get done with PT, they have about an hour before their next class. They go back, they take their shower, they get ready for class, and they fill out their PT log. So we get a realistic picture of how hard the workout was for them, how fatigued they were before the workout. Um, and it was, that, that implementation of that was gigantic, just to track all that information. Please. Yes, yeah. actually, yes. Um. Yeah, we, we do a number, that, so we do podcasts with them before they actually come to the academy. Um, Charlie and I, or Charlie or I, will, will just sit down with, uh, with whoever can get on uh, during that podcast and, and, and we'll, we'll answer any questions they have. Um, we do, or, or they can email us. They get the opportunity to email us, like uh, dietary concerns. So we get a lot of people with dietary concerns and they email us prior to the class. Uh, the one thing we don't do is we don't, we don't do programs for them. Um, we, we just tell them, hey, you need, need to come here in shape. And, you know, we can give you some guidelines, but we're not going to do a program for you. We, but uh, we, we do the best we can to prepare them for, for, for the academy. We do that because we don't own them yet. And if they were to get hurt doing something we suggested, there are some liability issues there. Um, but, yeah, there is yeah, definitely pro. Guys, I don't know why you showed up this early in the morning for this, but thank you for your attendance, and we'll be around. Yeah. Yeah.